Red Ray Gun Limited presents The Benji and Nick Show. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good day. Good to be here. Good night. Good gravy. Good more. Ah, oh, what? Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Oh, I was just so unprepared. Oh. Worthy in defeat, might I, might I say. You haven't said... Uh, Loch Ness, okay. my dear fellow. I could have just got away with that. I'm prompting you to defeat me. Uh, that was the Loch Ness game. It's not a game. And it's not about Loch Ness. But this is the Benji and Nick Show, your number one vintage television show in the known world, the British Isles, the Isles of Isles, the American Isles, the Australian Isles, the Plague Chinese Island. Isles, the, yes, Isles at the supermarket. We talk about vintage television, TV from the past, we look over it, we riff, we jam, we see if it's any good, and we tell you if it's worth a watch. We save you the hassle, basically. That's the, that's the ins and the outs. Is that outs, what we do? Well, I think to an extent, you know, we can say people don't watch that, it's not worth Worth it, or you can say, give it, give it a second of your time, just the one, and see what you think. And Christmas is gone. I'm still wearing my Christmas jumper. What's the matter with me? Well, it keeps you warm, doesn't it? True. It's very cold. It's functional. That's the beauty. It's it's beautifully functional. Today we're going to be talking about Poirot, the ABC murders. Hercule Poirot. When yes. was that? Uh, Made into a televisual production. Let's have a look. So I'll get up the memory banks up and we'll let you who know. So, yes. So, yes. We have to make sure we don't get the. I've typed it in. Because we thought we were watching get, the. F- what? Well, immediately, of course, you get the, the book, the Agatha Christie book of Poirot. Of but, um,. Because we, we thought we were watching the first episode ever, but it's not. This is the first episode of the fourth series. Which is one of the many inexplicable things that BritBox seems to do, which is uploading like, random, isn't it? Very. Well, it said it, it was the first. No, it says. Yeah, yeah, it does. It says this was the fourth series, but I don't know, I don't know why. How, how bizarre. That. How bizarre. But. Um, so, uh, Agatha Christie's Poirot started on the 8th of January 1989. That was the first one. and ran until 2013. So, it had a long old life. It certainly yeah, did. Yeah, I and, remember and it ending. Yeah. So do I, absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't even feel that long ago, really. It feels like it maybe two I years remember, ago. I remember watching the documentary about the final episode. Yeah. But absolutely, ah. you know, but without <clears throat> revealing too much, it is. Uh, an absolute classic, especially in the UK. Um, and yes. so we'll be introducing our guest uh, reviewer, Shelley Dean, who will give us her perspective on this show mm. from the USA. So that'll be interesting. And our friend Jamie Anderson may or may not be turning up. Actually, I've just had a little exchange with him on uh, messaging, and he says that he will be turning up if we stick to our schedule. Which so we will, because we are professionally not. Yes, yes. In a moment, uh, your email sent to podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. Uh, once again, thanks to many of you who have subscribed to us on Patreon. It's Looking enabling wrong. us to create all sorts of brilliant extra content. And it also gives you a discount on merchandising at nicholasbriggs.com. But that's enough of the plugs. We don't want to the upset plugs. people. Do go on to your page. Do go on. Have a look at the Patreon. There's loads of fun things on there. Extra content, extra commentaries, all bits and bobs like that. Exclusive audio dramas, merchandise, you name it. There's lots on there, and of course our Discard, Discord account as well. Discard, so, call, call, call. Discars. This disc car is a drivable car, um, and yeah. So check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Um, <laughs> now your emails sent to podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. Shall I read the first one? Go for it's, it. So it's called. The Daleks in Technicolor. Uh, this was sent on the 17th of December in the year 2150. How about AD. that? He sent it at oh, 2150. That couldn't be more perfect. Was, uh, that, was that intentional? Surely. Uh, yeah, you've got to be. From Steve Craddock. Anyway, hi, Steve. Jack oh, good evening, one and all. Well, I was nine when I watched The Dead Planet live, which was my very first ever episode of Doctor Who following recommendation from my classmates and was hooked right from the enigmatic opening shot with its ominous title through to the terrifying climax with, as Shelley noted, Barbara being threatened by whatever it could be behind 
behind that arm. I didn't know about sink plungers at that age. Well, no, it's something you learn about later in life, I believe. <laughs> it was a long week. L hyphen O hyphen N hyphen G. Long week till the next episode. There were lots of other great moments in the story. For example, Susan with the petrified flower. Oh, that's the petrified flower. It's petrified. And the exploration of the mysterious and apparently empty city. This principle of exploration is one of the things that I loved about those early stories and miss these days. A, casually, a casualty of accelerated levels of drama and compressed storytelling. I see what you mean, that kind of wandering, aimless wandering is, is highly underrated. It certainly is. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, I'm not a suitable candidate for the proposed memory extraction to restore the lost episodes, even though you saw it at the time. <laughs> Although I did see many of them, including Marco Polo, which explained the principle of condensation to a young, inquiring mind. Now then, young, inquiring fellow, would you like to know about condensation? <laughs> uh, no, thanks. I'd rather play with my toy cars. Uh, I didn't see them all, as my parents decided that the programme was too scary for me and my younger brother. Your parents! Uh, watching as we were from behind the sofa and we were banned from watching it for a while we wore them down eventually good dot on dot you. dot good exclamation on mark you. but before then to Woking emails pass him what's that mean came the Daleks I don't know what that means to Woking emails pass him what does emails pass him mean das weiß ich nicht. Does it, is it latin do you think uh, real daleks in color and in the flesh oh yes i assume this must have been as a promotion for the film uh, though the lovely caroline ford was there in person and i was pleased to get her wow. autograph I must find the book, which is in a box somewhere in my mother's loft. During all this excitement, I was disappointed to see someone's head silhouetted through the gauze below the dome. What is that part called? Yeah, that's, I don't know. The grating? The neck grating. The grating, the gr grating yeah. yeah. And realised that there was someone actually inside the case. So I knew that these were only pretend Daleks, not the real thing as seen on television. Of course, of course. Ah, the films. I was so excited to see the Daleks at the cinema, but was again disappointed, the many tragedies of youth, exclamation mark, that there were different people from the television show. The music was wrong, and Doctor Who was just some eccentric old boffin in his garden shed. How ridiculous. How could they get so much wrong? <laughs> Ooh, my initial angst was mollified by the film when it got going, and the sheer magnificence of Daleks on the big screen. I still think I think I still have the cinema poster somewhere in that loft too well I've got the cinema poster but I bought it many years later Peter Cushing Peter Cushing Peter Cushing Peter Cushing Peter Cushing <laughs> just to keep the name check count up how he found time to paint paint as well I really don't know that's true we were saying he was very busy in doing a million films a year slight exaggeration I enjoyed the second film more well that's not unusual and remember seeing a teaser preview program on television in black and white the only recollection of which I have now now is some sort of short interview with Godfrey Quigley and or clips of <laughs> wow. Dortmund and the sequence of his dramatic sacrifice with some coverage of how the scene was achieved. So seeing it again in colour and in context had quite an impact. Bernard Cribbins, right said Fred, and digging that hole was great. And the wraparound about the raid and the police box was imaginative. Definitely. I recently rewatched the story on Britbox and still thoroughly enjoyed it. Yes, the slither was a bit underwhelming in practice, but William Russell gave it plenty of conviction, as always, brilliant. And the betrayal by the two women was gripping. It was a long wait until Doctor Who was again on the big screen, but over the years, I have had the Dalek Mania pair on VHF... VHF? <laughs> Video... Shooting in France. Video VHF long wave uh, DVD and Blu-ray and now streaming for good measure and it just looks better and better I just need a bigger television I particularly enjoyed Shelley's perspective on these and previous podcasts and she is a great addition to the team we must remember to tell her we'll always we'll forget though we won't tell her will we we'll just forget her voice reminds me of my sister-in-law Boston area half Italian parentage though she has yet to be fully acquainted with my brother's love of Doctor Who <laughs> Yes, the Patreon stuff did seem to go on for ages, but it was launch and it was exciting that you were all so genuinely excited by it. So I didn't mind. I didn't mind it that one time, that one time, I'll try to read properly next time. And I'm sure coverage <laughs> will settle down in future. It has settled down, Steve. Yeah. Uh, good luck with it. 
I'll only be joining one of the moderate levels as I'll have to raid my big finish budget. Otherwise, ooh, that's a dodgy choice there, isn't it? I just received a copy of the Daleks comic strip reprint book from Panini, the Bookazine, I think they call it, via the Jerry Anderson store, which is wonderful. Yeah, I got one of those as well. It's fantastic. Have you got it, Benji? You're just getting it now. There we yes. go. There we go. That's so dog. close. It's I glorious, can feel, isn't it? I can feel its fire. I took me right back. I got TV21 from issue one and was a big fan of Richard Jennings' art. I did used to get TV21, but not all the time, uh, which got better and better. Back in the day, I had the Dalek pocketbook and the Dalek annuals as well. I didn't have the pocketbook, but I did have the Dalek book and the Dalek outer space book. I I missed the Dalek world for some reason. Uh, Lots more to say, but this is too long already. No, it isn't. Steve stroke Jack. Uh, many thanks to you all for a very enjoyable podcast and I hope you all stay safe and have an enjoyable and relaxing Christmas that was in the past we've received this before Christmas I expect uh, it's not Christmas yet when we're recording this well I'm sure we did have an enjoyable and relaxing Christmas just a shame about that atomic bomb Um, best wishes Jack (laughs) well there we go and to quote the Daleks in this fantastic book yes um, what is this disturbance in Sky 7 yeah, what is words, this the words, the, the, All the ships have been fitted with Mag, mag Ray Ultimate. Of I course, have ordered yes. that it is to be fired at each meteorite, thus filling it with deathless prayers. It's just, you know, I mean, you can't. <laughs> Emperor, the warhead is still travelling towards Scaro. It must be stopped. Not my words, the words of the Daleks. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Well, Jack Craddock. We must move on. Thank you for emailing in. This next one is from Declan Kennedy, and is the subject of this one is bum gusts. <laughs> so we can already see which is where this is going. Dear Nick and Benji, hello once again. It's time from Tier 4. Um, the tiers in England, of course. Uh, some people in Tier 2, some Tier... Nobody's in Tier 1. Everybody's in Tier 2. There's Tier 3 and Tier 4, just in case you live somewhere else. Um, which, like Michael Bay film, arrived without warning to make everybody utterly miserable. You're not wrong. Um, I was deeply heartened to hear of the return of Pooh Monkey. Um, he may not be the hero Gotham wants, but he is indeed the hero we need. And look forward to Pooh Monkey making his debut in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now that, spoiler alert, Iron Man is gone, I hope that Pooh Monkey will step up alongside his colleagues of Chod Warrior, the Turd Wrangler, and, my favourite one here, Big Nappy Man. Uh, <laughs> together, they face down Thanos, the Mad Toilet. Oh, Isn't dear. it Thanos? <laughs> Of course it is, yes. Uh, That is all for now. Please return to your seats. Oh, and may I suggest for your viewing pleasure, Kinvig. It's uh, an experience. DK. Well, I had a look at Kinvig. It looks like an experience. It looks quite fun, actually. I remember it. I remember watching it at the time, yeah. Was it it, it good? (laughs) Well, I think it was slightly too uh, old for me. I think I was a fairly young teenager. I'm not sure. What year was it, Kinvig? Oh, let's have a look. Do your interweb and Troid oh, thing. Oh, I done? I'm not done. It's all right. We're still so rolling. Do you want me to... No, it's fine. I just um, I clicked the metronome by mistake. Um, Kinvig. 1981. Oh, I wasn't... I was quite... Um... Wow, it's earlier than I thought. London. Yeah, I was just television. at drama school then. Yeah, I do remember it, though. Hmm. It's just a quickie here from Neil Allen. Uh, commented on uh, on uh, Patreon. Shh, don't mention it. Uh, he said, um, Shelley has just blown my mind. Cybermen are related to Robomen. Next thing she'll say, Dalek troopers from Resurrection of the Daleks are related to Daleks. It's great to get another person's perspective. There we are. Uh, as as uh, those of you who listened to the last podcast, you'll realise that Shelley did have a Cyberman, a 10th Planet Cyberman and a Roboman from the Dalek Invasion of Earth in a picture just to prove how similar they were and I, I can see It's um, fair, it's fair It's I'm fair gonna... yeah. It's a fair Yeah. Well, I suppose i better invite her in Bring her in, bring her in Let's start yeah, We this. might be a bit early for her, she might be a bit you know, shocked She might be in the bath <laughs> La, da, 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 da. <laughs> One of those oh, big that's... brushes you know, loofah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah <laughs> There we are. Uh, 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 isn't that the German Air Force? 
The Luftwaffe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. The Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. We so, must go to the uh, art museum in Paris. What's it called? The Luftwaffe. <laughs> it's a bit soapy. Yes. <laughs> ah. Right. Oh, you've uh, seen my mate. He does a bit of work. He's a, he's a Luftwaffe. <laughs> Is he? Good Lord. So we jumped ahead and invited you. And she's thinking, oh, I thought I had a quarter of an hour left. I thought I'd gone away with it, you pesky meddling kids. <sighs> but it's very funny, isn't it? Podcasting from before Christmas to a podcast that's, you know, several, like two weeks after Christmas. We're living, we're just living in the future, aren't we? It's like time travel. No start. Yeah, and then we won't, we won't have one of these for a while. It'll be very strange, won't it? Sitting in this old chair, at this old desk, at this old computer. Olds always used to be a term of affection, you know, old chap. Oh, I always use things like, oh, old chap. Yeah. Definitely. That, yeah. That, a lot of people think, oh, are you saying I'm old? It's not that at all. Here we no, are. not quite. It means I'm familiar, not... been around a long time, you know. Yes, oh, dear chap. Hello, you old chap. Ah, oh, yeah, how about nice that proficiency? Like that. Look at that, perfect. <laughs> Looking wonderful as always, Shelley. Hello. Greetings, Hello. greetings. How are we today? Good. Now, look, someone says something nice about you. I'm going to remember well, to well say. Well done for remembering. Because <laughs> I always say we must remind her and then we forget. What does she say, though? <laughs> Oh, what did she say? You're making what this you... up now. No, now no, no. Just... Writing was... something really quick, like, oh, God, we, we just said it. Now we've got to make something up. <sighs> Shelly Jean is the most amazing human being. It well, wasn't it a she said... that said it, by the way. It was a he that said it. It was a he. It. See, yes. you can't even agree on that. <laughs> he, yeah, the person we've made up. Now, a guy called Steve Craddock said your perspective was very, uh, on the Dalek films. Garbage? Was very enjoyable. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Okay. I got so, criticized by a friend of mine telling me that my opinion of the TV series was wrong. <laughs> well, in, what, in what respect? And I said I didn't say it was. I said I just preferred the movie because of the way I, the, the way I watched it. I watched the movie first, yeah. and then I watched the series. So it, it just changed my perspective on it. I said if I had watched it in the other order, I'm sure it would have been a completely different outcome. Uh, so Not necessarily. I mean, I think it's true. I'm, I agree with you, Shelley. I think the TV... And I won't say his name, but he'll know who he is. Is it Ken Deep? <laughs> it is. No, I knew it would be Ken. I knew it would be Ken. <laughs> Immediate. <laughs> See, Ken, that wasn't me calling you, you out hide. for my name. Can't hide. <laughs> very, it was very Ken Deep. D- deeply held views from Ken. Um, but the thing is, in my opinion, the... Uh, Movies are much just, they're just an easier watch, aren't they? Yes. You have to, with the TV series, you're, you're, it's like looking at an ancient Latin text, you know, you kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? You have, you have to, you have to translate it in order yeah. to be able to understand it. And once you're, once you're fully uh, immersed in that, it's fine. Uh, you're okay but yeah obviously the movie is just much more accessible and yeah you know and well, it's, easy well, it's on the just, eye and the ear you know it's condensed down it's a quicker quicker you know things get to the point quicker and like yeah, the, i said when i was reviewing this this series it just dragged on i thought i was watching yeah. nine it was six but it did feel like nine so it's a long, it's a long view <laughs> it's and it's great like i do you know i do enjoy watching it uh, definitely it's not that i don't enjoy watching it but it's as nick said it's a bit easier to just sit and lock into the film isn't it mm. I've, yeah. the, the tv one has grown on me particularly right. when they did it they do uh because those old episodes in particular were only uh they were recovered and they were on 16 millimeter film where in the old days they only the only way they could send um copies of programs out to other countries that didn't have video technology is that they'd play the videotape of the episode and they would film it with a 16 millimeter <sighs> camera and that's the those are the copies that came back so when they came back they had you know, because Doctor Who has a very video quality to the picture. Right. They, when they came back, they all looked like film. Yeah. Um, but since that, 
Clever boffins at the restoration team, they're called, aren't they? They created a technique called vid fire, yeah. which added an extra field into the picture. Boring stuff that I barely understand, which returned it to it made it look like video again. So okay. it suddenly became sort of more immediate. And that's when I fell in love with it again, when I watched it. And those Daleks looked like they'd been filmed yesterday, but just in black and white, you know. <laughs> um, so I kind of got back into it then. But uh, yeah, it's... Well, we're just going in. I'm yeah. just going into the same review. It's not. It's not a s strongly realised piece of television, is it? Yeah. It's fair no. to say. Sorry, Ken, but it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong. No. But you know, I like Death to the Daleks, and so many yeah. people cannot believe that I would like that. By the is way, he... um, it just occurred to me before we get on to um, talking about Poirot. 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 Um, well, uh, I did say it like that at one point. I where did. are we with our the Doctor pirates. Who? Where are we with our Doctor Who commentaries? Well, this is what I was going to raise. I was going to raise this issue when we were choosing what to do next week because we do need to, We should continue. We need to with, crack on with Inferno. Yeah, we'll yeah. do that, won't we? Yeah, we did three. We did episode three was our last. Yeah, I believe we got so. Four yeah. more to go. So, so yeah. we need to yeah. just know, let it to, hanging. We need pedal to the metal there. Yeah. I was suggesting we were going to do what we've been watching, but I think we should do Inferno. No, we, we need to do okay. we need so to Inferno okay. it up. But, anyway, uh, look, we're doing it all in the wrong order. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, should, we, should we rock into Poirot? Poirot? Yeah. Yes. So, it's Shelley, familiar. you know, yes. were you familiar of Poirot as a character? Or as the book, um, only in very peripheral ways. Okay, just that Agatha Christie wrote these these books with this this detective, and then she wrote the Miss Marple ones, and you know, so very yeah. peripherally, I knew of, um, I knew didn't know who the character was and how different it was from, say, Sherlock Holmes, the way gotcha. that those stories go, um, and my only visual knowledge of it is seeing it on streaming services like you know like a little square <laughs> yeah of course yeah. <laughs> a little, yeah, little thinking, square I'm not watching that thing yeah. with that man and with the stupid moustache it yeah. just looked too posh and intelligent for me um, but I loved it absolutely loved it and um, I forgot that I was watching a period piece which says a lot about the way it's done because a lot of times when I'm watching something that's supposed to be taking place in the past I'm way focused on whether or not the cars are right the clothes are right the you know all the if they're hitting it just right and halfway through I went oh snap this is supposed to be in the 30s I was like I didn't even it didn't even yeah, think it it, it, just, it was so just yeah it was just it wasn't too old timey if that makes it's any sense it's done with great ease isn't it yeah yes. yeah um, and I actually felt like the whole time I was watching it, like I'm a huge true crime, murder, mystery. I love, I eat that stuff up. I, I used to say to my husband, I can kill you and get away with it because I know how to, <laughs> I know what the criminals do wrong. <laughs> um, but it, it, a lot of times my problems with watching or reading murder mysteries is I figure it out too quick. Yes. And then, then the ending is just kind of like, all right, let's just get to where. I bet you, you know. thought you'd figure this one out. Yeah. And that's my point of this. Real was red herring city, isn't you it? You get into it and you're just like, oh, okay, well, obvious. And then it's just like, twisty, twisty, you know, yeah. abracadabra, it's not what you know, but wait, there's more. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was fun, wasn't so it? That, I really that, thought I'd sussed it and thought it was really superficial. Yeah, yeah, me too. And so that's what made me. I just was clinging to it the whole time once I got to a point where I was like, I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea where this is going to end up. So that made me super duper enjoy it. And that's, and he's that's just Agatha amazing. Christie all over. She's famed for being remarkable at writing good twists and keeping you yeah. on the edge oh, yeah. of your seat. She cheats ridiculously. She oh, invents absolutely. And she's not the kind of thriller writer. There are some, some thriller writers who plant clues so you could have worked it out. Mm -hmm. 
Agatha Christie cheats. She doesn't put any of those clues in there. And then she tells you something new that you never knew about in the yeah. last third of it. She goes, oh, by the way, you know, he had five <laughs> legs, you know, whatever. You go, what? How did he conceal that? Oh, well, you see, yeah, you know, well. <laughs> it's some real cheats, but that, but you get that the really brilliance. gets people going. Yeah. It gets people going, but also it gives you that immediate, you think that's the brilliance of our hero in this story, Poirot's brilliance, where he turns around and he said, it's too obvious. It's yeah. too obvious that they think that they've got me fooled, you know, and it's... But there's it's that marvellous one... bit where at the at the races in Doncaster where everyone, uh, huge crowds there for horse races and they keep focusing on Poirot just sitting there and he's got his eyes closed and he's just thinking, thinking. And then finally, he just smiles mm-hmm. and he just goes rushing towards Hastings and goes, Hastings, Hastings, you know, and he <laughs> is sussed it at that yeah. point, you know, That's but he's just been moment. thinking in all that chaos. That's quite fun, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it was no, very he... strange for me to watch this actually because um, it takes place in my neck of the woods at oh. like Bex Hill on Sea, which is yeah. where I I've spent pretty much all of my life up until two or three years ago. I grew up there. I know that everything, every road, every pl- that the seafront, that building where they the big building, the, the Delaware, Delaware, the Delaware Pavilion. I mean that place for me. I, not only have I played gigs there since I was about probably about 14 you know I was I was at that lovely mm. colonnade as it is on the outside I was there with my friends when I wasn't old enough to drink sitting drinking all kinds of things hidden away oh. you know Ooh, that that for me boy. that that whole place is like that's the, my childhood really is like wow. grow, I grew up with my friends there so to see it like that and see it back when it was was actually quite a thrill and also I, I spent the whole time thinking oh yes so they're not actually in the downstairs section there. They're, up, they're upstairs, <laughs> right, yeah. Did they... Uh, was, would that have been filmed after they'd recently restored the place? I'm trying to... In fact, this is a good idea. Because it looks brand new, doesn't it? Which is great for the setting, because it would have looked new back then. And they, yeah. I think it must have been, because um, the front the front tower bit, as it were... Mm. I say front, it's actually, I guess, it's, the back towards the car classic park. Art Deco, isn't it? Oh, it's gorgeous, but that was closed off and it was unsafe in there and they restored it and that was... seemed they, There was a shot with them in there. Yes. So, let's have a look. When when, when Maybe was this, that was a set. That... Maybe, I don't think no, it, it was, because it, it went from the outside see. and it went yeah. up, up there and, and they, yeah. they were... Stand, so, this was 1992. So, it would have been before... It might have been in the in-between time, like maybe they, they were able to film in there, but they this was before it was properly restored. Oh. But um, yeah, I've been there. I saw Panto there. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah. I it's don't not, know why. Oh, nice. my mate, a mate of mine was in it. That's why I went down there to see it, yeah. It's yeah. a very interesting building because it's still, to this day, they still rely heavily on the uh, the 19... Uh, was it 1930s kind of... The builds of the acoustics inside so it's a really interesting thing they have these dimples on the roof which reflect the sound out it's a really weird building i personally don't like playing music in there i don't it's good to listen to music but it's not really good to play music if that makes sense the acoustics bounce back to you probably just different weird, than the, it hits the audience it's a bit of a weird one yeah i mean i the last time i was there i saw al stewart there not lo- last year i saw al stewart there actually and sweet, and then the year before that, Gary Newman. So there we go. Oh, that was Gary Newman was there. Gary's in, there, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, d- I remember you filmed a bit of that. <laughs> yeah, well, then, so there we go. So that's that. So for me, it wasn't immersion breaking, but I was obviously I spent the oh, every scene in Bexhill, and every time they mention either Bexhill or Saint Leonard's or Eastbourne, I was immediately sort of like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah well, that's got to be there then. <laughs> and a lot of that place, a lot of the architecture, the houses and things around there hasn't changed really, which which made it easier for that. It's easy for them, was easy for them to find locations, which you know, and just film them kind of cleverly. I mean, where I felt just to be negative for a moment, where this production fell apart as. The, the stock footage they used, which was clearly from some movie or something, was clearly not from this production. It, it looked like it was film put onto videotape and transferred back to film or something. There was something weird going on. But I should say a thing for Shelley's benefit about Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie is an incredible phenomenon in this country and has a huge loyalty. I mean, mentioning pantos was apposite because theatres in this country before the pandemic mainly made 
most of their money, commercial theatres, from pantomimes at Christmas. That's when the, some theatres take 75% of their revenue at Christmas with the pantomime. Mm. The rest of the year, they make a loss, you know. Right. Uh, the other thing that theatres that are smart, commercial theatres that are smart, make their money out of are thrillers. Audiences who don't particularly like theatre do go to the theatre to see pantomimes and thrillers. And the most popular author of theatre thrillers is Agatha Christie and all the adaptations of her work. Um, uh, Bill Kenwright and his company, he's a big theatre producer in this uh, country, bought up the rights to all the Agatha Christie stuff uh, quite a few years back now. And that robbed a whole load of theatre companies from uh, of, of huge revenue. Because, you know, when I used to do thriller seasons at the Theatre Royal Nottingham, you know, the audience's levels would be like that. And then for the Agatha Christie week, it would just... Agatha Christie, as many producers said to me, had her own audience and they would yeah. always turn up. Wow. You know, uh, so it, it's a huge thing and audiences absolutely love them. And they're, they're, um, they're hilarious to be in. <laughs> we had so much fun doing them, you know. My favourite one um, that I was in was called The Hollow. It wasn't a, an Hercule Poirot story. But the audience gets so invested in the characters that I played the character in the first half of the play who ends up getting murdered just before the interval, right? And he's a right so-and-so. He's having affairs with all the women and he's being rotten to all the men and he thinks he's the bee's knees and really charming. So I, I got to snog all the women and be rude to all the men. <laughs> and then at the end of the, the first half of the play, I go to the um, French windows and see someone and go, oh, what are you doing there? And then bang, I get shot. <laughs> I spin round and fly over the sofa. That was that death was, of course, of my death devising. Yes. I, I, I said to the director, I said, I think he just ooh, wanted me to ooh. drop dead behind the sofa. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm going to, the, the recoil from the bullet hitting me is going to knock me on the sofa. I spin round and my face will be in the audience. Like, oh, like that. Well, I did all this. It used to go down really well because, you know, uh, audiences yeah. love it when a gun goes off on stage <laughs> and uh, a fake gun, hopefully. And uh, someone in the front row looked up at me and went, good. <laughs> <laughs> Which well, is, in I, my, during I my bet research, you saw, did you laugh? Surely. No, no, I didn't. But it's either a comment on my performance or she hated the character yeah. so much. She was, she was really into it. Yeah. Well, one thing I did come upon on my researching was that Agatha Christie in most of her stories the people who get murdered are just wretched horrible detestable people and that this particular story was one of the first where there were actually sympathetic characters who got killed yes and That's i found that very fascinating because yeah. it's it is and you just making that point that somebody was like good it really is because she makes these characters that you don't feel bad that they got killed because yes. it's kind of like, ah, he had it coming, see? Yeah. And, <laughs> and so in this one, these are just innocence. And being so much that it, the way that the setup we find out at the end is, so one murder gets hidden in amongst all these other murders. So it was just, a, that's interesting that, that yeah. that's how she writes them. So No, that's a really good point actually were you being Jimmy Cag Cagney then when you said he had coming see just doing my old gangster kind of shade there you go. <laughs> James Cagney will do yeah that'll yeah, work it absolutely works well I mean one thing I'm, I, I, I feel the need to say really is just how fantastic the casting is in this in my opinion I just think it's everybody's brilliant you know from David Suchet as Poirot he just oh, captures amazing. that wonderful arrogance of the character that I know of... he is so unlikable isn't he that's my problem with Poirot he's I such disagree. an irritating little turd isn't he oh I didn't <laughs> find him irritating at all I he's thought so him, arrogant. I, I didn't feel that way I just felt that he was he knew what he knew and he knew it you know <laughs> it wasn't like an in your face I'm better than all of you kind of, I don't know I just that's how I got it so there is an air of that though there's an air of yeah but maybe I am that good yeah, yeah. of course you've got you the sort of like him in spite of himself don't you right I, absolutely <laughs> well, it's, you know you've got you've got Hugh Fraser who's just fantastic as Captain Hastings oh he, my like, gosh you have to love Hastings he's wanting just, to tell wanting how does to tell he get anything story. done like the alligator anything. <laughs> no, it's a Cayman. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not said, an alligator. Actually, it's a very interesting story. People cut him off, and then the guy at the end says, uh, oh, "I'd I like always... to hear that story." And he's like, "And they... then they like sneak out, shut the door, <laughs> like, okay, here you go." I mean, I have to say, he's uh, um, Poirot's right hand man, isn't he, Captain Hastings? And um, uh, Hugh Fraser playing him. They're, uh, Hugh doesn't do any subtlety in this role, does he? I no. mean, when a pretty woman turns up, he he literally goes, <laughs> "Oh, you know." <laughs> it's like the cartoon character. The eyeballs come out, yeah. and go ooga ooga. Yeah. <laughs> He's a total lech, isn't he? Like yeah. when he followed that woman into the kitchen and shut the door in Farrow's face. Well, he's, he's just Farrow wonderful. Walks sort in of... and looks at him and say, "Don't shut yourself in a kitchen with a pretty woman." Thank you yeah. very much. He's a bit, of an, a bit of an old fool, isn't he? You know, in yeah. a wonderful way in that respect. And I just, for me, the real trait was Donald Sumter in this one. Oh. I just, I love everything he's in. I always think he's fantastic. Well, and can I, I my loved funny him in this. thing Which was when that? he came on screen. Cust. Cust. Oh, the, the actual, oh, right. Yeah. He, my, Hitting you know, it's one of those, off. you see somebody and you go, oh, oh, that's, I know that guy. That guy's from, and my first thought was that he was the guy who played the really creepy old preacher in Poltergeist 2. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yes. Did he? Yes. That was my first thought, and then I was like, "It wasn't like, no. him, was it? No. No, no, no. I no. thought it was and then him, I, wasn't it? And then I realized that it was from he was Game of Thrones. He was Meister somebody or another. I don't remember Meister anybody's Lewin, he? name in Game of Thrones. And he was Rassilon in, in right. Doctor Who, the the twelfth episode. I was like. Of course, and I here I am thinking it was from Poltergeist too. That creepy old guy. We we asked him to reprise that role, you know, in Big Finish, and he said uh-huh. he didn't want to do it because he didn't have a nice time filming it. Oh, he didn't, he didn't want to do that character again. Isn't that I mean, hard? I remember That's him. That's terrible in... revelation that no one's ever said that, and I probably shouldn't have said it. But what the hey? It's the Benji and Nick show. Why not? He, he's been in loads of things. He was in yeah. he was in um, Crocodile Shoes too. I remember him. He was in a show that I grew up watching, which is The Queen's Nose, in which he played Uncle Ginger. And I always remember finding him absolutely terrifying because he dies in it as well. Because oh, um, he looks he also a gaunt sorry. character, isn't he? Yes. He was also the twitching uh, submarine captain in the Sea Devils, a 1972 Gosh, Doctor Who yes. story. It's where the yeah, Sea Devils are about is. to board a ship. Uh, well. That's the creepy old guy from Poltergeist <laughs> 2. <laughs> right. I can see I'm it. showing a picture to the video camera. <laughs> well, I can't really see it because I'm and not going to... Hold on, show me again. I'm going to get the I'm going to get the picture bigger. Hold on a sec. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I can I can completely see it. Right, yeah. It looks more like that than I do. Yeah. And then I realized the the what made me realize it what it couldn't possibly be him was the years that this was filmed. Yes. Cause, and then when that was when Poltergeist two was, I was like, oh no, he the, if Poltergeist two was filmed now maybe, but not. <laughs> He's Enrico I mean, Casali in Wild in Space as well. Oh, he is, isn't he? Another oh, Doctor yeah. Who story. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think most of his episodes don't exist, do they? Well, not definitely not Wheel in Space. Wheel in no, Space. Yeah. There's only two. Are there only two remaining was, episodes of in, Wheel in Space? Yeah, I think there's only two. That's a um, six-part story. Yeah. Wheel in Space. It is six-part These story. are the important yeah, facts. Um, These are the. I'd, I'd like to say a couple of negative things. Okay. Even Go though I really did enjoy, it and and it and like you, Shelley, it was the ending that really sold it to me. I find. I, I was very aware of Praro being on and I, I never really got into it because I found it very staid and unimaginatively done. And and I think it is done like that for a very... It was done on ITV, our commercial channel, um, the main commercial channel on terrestrial television. And, you know, the, the idea for programmes on ITV that they're not too taxing on the brain, you know. And this is very... Um, uh, plain fair isn't it there's although there's that nice twist at the end there's nothing to tax you in the way the story's told and it's very um it's sort of shot very adequately on film and looks very polished everyone's wearing uh three percent too much makeup I can, yeah I, can, I noticed I that see, i did notice that although of course it's because it's on film it's probably sort of HD quality now and it it wouldn't have looked that clear back in the day Um, and it's just um, it's very safely done you know what I mean but after a while you get caught up in that way it does it and you think it's just that a lot more imaginative and um, experimental things were being done at that time 
and this program does not do it it's i think it's so, sleepy television it's comfort telly isn't yeah. it it's you know you want to have your dinner i do sit, think that uh, Rick, this, um, yeah. uh, what's his name christopher gunning who did the um theme for dangerous knowledge dangerous. he also did the music for day of the triffids yeah well, I think his score, his incidental score for this is really... I don't like the theme. The theme annoys me. I um, like but the theme, I, I, but, but it's not right. But, yeah, <laughs> it's not do, right. Do, do, do. I think his score for it, for the episode, was amazing, actually. I thought it was really beautiful and sounded like a movie score a lot of the time. Well, here's a little bit of trivia yes. about that. Um, in fact, the score makes use of the notes A, B, and C ah. as its basis. And Come the announcement up. of each murder is accompanied by its note, A, B, or C. Clever. Isn't that superb? Isn't that? Yeah. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it, really? Yeah. Like so it. So I thought that, I underlined that in my notes because I thought that was so interesting. Because I don't, I'm not somebody who pays attention so much to the music of things, unless it's annoying and like yeah. in your face. If it's if it's good to me, it's because I don't really notice it. It just kind of melts into yeah. you know everything and else. This, but I, I thought that was fascinating. It was yeah. And it was beautifully supporting the action. I've got a personal story related to Poirot a bit that takes us on a tangent if you can bear it. I may have told this story before, but if I did it was about two years ago. So it's time for a repeat. <laughs> I went for an audition to play a part in an episode of Poirot that was written by Mark Gatiss. And Mark got me the audition as a friend. He, he, he's always been so great to me. And he contacted the casting and the director and the casting people and said, you know, my mate Nick Briggs is a really good actor uh, and you really should see him. So they got me in to play the part of, I think it was a sergeant. And it was a good middling little part. He had lots of cheeky little lines and funny little things to do. And uh, I went in and he, and he was meant to be a bit of light relief, you know. Hmm. I can't remember anything. He, he sort of, you know, I don't know, kept popping up and tripping over and things like that. They and saw I did your the... death scene in the show that you did. <laughs> this guy's got comedy trousers, they thought. Um, <laughs> so I did the audition. It was one of the best auditions I've ever done. And the director, I can't remember the director, but he was delightful. And he really, he laughed and he liked what I did. And he just said, it's really good. I really enjoyed that, Nick. Thank you. It's lovely to meet you. And I thought, yeah, whatever. I got home and was immediately told I'd got the part. Wow. And it was amazing. And I was so excited. And Mark said, that was brilliant. And then the next day, Mark contacted me and said, look, this is awful. I'm really sorry. They, it turns out they, they've, re, they've rewritten the script and they've taken that character out of it. Oh, <laughs> no. And he said, they're really, really embarrassed. And they want to offer you another part in it, you know, just straight away without an audition. He said, my advice is not to take it because it's so, the other part is virtually non-speaking, but they just want you to do something because they feel bad about it. He said, but, you know, if you say no, the casting director said she will keep you in mind and, and get you in for something at some point. Um, and so I, I, I said no. I looked at the part and it was, I just thought this is, you know, I, yeah. I, I, and they were perfectly fine about it. Um, and then a few years later, I can't remember exactly when, but it was the same year I did that episode of Torchwood. In fact, I ended up filming this thing, I think in the same week I did Torchwood. Uh, I, I was called in by this casting director. My agent just said that so-and-so, quite an important casting director, wants to see. I thought, oh, isn't she the one who... She got me into uh, audition for an episode of Lewis. Do you know Lewis? Yeah, Lewis, no. big, no, I'm big looking, deal. No, I'm looking at Shelley. Of course yeah. you know Lewis. No. Um, it's a big, big t um, uh, detective show on British television. And it was to play the part of a social worker. I read the character description. I was about 40 at the time. It said a slightly podgy 40-year-old. <laughs> I was really annoyed. I, I thought, am I podgy? I think looking back, I probably was. But anyway, um, I did the audition and they really liked it. And they got back and they said, yeah, you're absolutely brilliant. And this will work really well. We've only got one problem, which means we can't cast you. And, and we said, what's that? They said, you're, you're not really as podgy as we'd like you to be. And I thought, yes, that. come on. Yeah, enough. that's I worth, don't, it, I worth don't losing mind. a job for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and they said, however, I mean, listen, there's another part that again is quite small but there's a, a couple of lines um and we we wouldn't audition you for it where if you want it you can just have it and you'd be playing joanna lumley's lawyer 
So, and so I, went, I said, yeah, yeah, bring it on. And so I went in and spent a day filming with Joanna Lumley. And she treated me. You know who Joanna Lumley is, yes. do you? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, she treated me like I was the star. Aww. Oh, bless her. She's so, she even told me where she lived. <laughs> To, she to definitely where, didn't think you were she, too podgy. Oh. I know. She just said, to, <laughs> "She said, oh, do you know so and so? This particular area of of London." And I said, "Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a friend who lives on so and so." And she went, "Oh, I know that. Well, we're just behind. You know, so and so square." I said, "I know." She said, "Just over to the left, where the bins are down the alleyway." I said, "Yes, I know that." She said, "Well, that's our gate there." I thought, "Why are you telling this complete stranger <laughs> exactly where you live?" It was totally weird, but she was delightful. And just before we do a take, she, she they'd say turn over and she turned around to me because we just spent a lot of time sitting together being viewed through the two-way mirror by the detectives you know in the in the interrogation room um and she uh, she said she'd say to me just full take got a little uh, nugget for you about sapphire and steel in a minute anyway you know oh wow she, bless, her. Uh, bless her how cool is that yeah see it says she knew she knew you'd appreciate it well i mean yeah you know that's the wonderful thing about British telly isn't it we do have so many icons like that and people who do you know jobs like she you know Joanna Lumley and Lewis as well I think is pretty a pretty damn cool thought in itself isn't it yeah yeah she did a strange Scottish accent in it which was an odd choice but anyway um I uh that, that's how Poirot helped me to get a TV job even though it wasn't in Poirot but wow it would have been lovely to have been in an episode of Poirot I think Mark Gatiss was writing one as part of his bucket list you know like I want to write an episode of Poirot before it finishes he's so, a great I'll tell you what though, he's a great choice for it he's you know when, when you when you say oh Mark Gatiss you know did an episode of Poirot it's one of those sort of oh of course he would yeah. You know, it's like such yeah. an obvious choice for somebody to work on it. So good on him. But anyway, back to the actual episode. I would say, yeah, I got a warm, fuzzy feeling at the end of it and was very, yeah. very happy. It was exciting. <laughs> it was an exciting reveal. Yeah, uh, in spite that, of all the, uh, you know, pedestrian nature of it. Andrew Grieve, is that his name, directed it? Let's have a look. Uh, Greaves, yeah. Greaves. Greaves. Didn't he do G-R-I-E-V-E, Destiny? G R I E V E, yeah. Yeah, didn't he do um, Destiny of the Daleks? I'll double check that before I agree. He did Hornblower, of course. That makes ah. a lot of sense. Ah. Um, he did Warship. Oh, well, another great series. I love a really creaky old he, thing. I'm not seeing any Destiny of the Daleks, but maybe he worked on it. No, no, as... I, I'm thinking that. Well, look up Destiny of the Daleks specifically and see whether. He didn't do it. Let's have a look. Destiny. Didn't he? I thought he did a Doctor Who. I'm not seeing any Doctor Who here. Destiny of the Daleks was directed by... People are screaming out loud right now. Ken Grieve. Ken Grieve. Oh, his baby brother. <laughs> I've just made that bit up. Just no <laughs> idea. No, he, did, he did all of the... He did all of the... For, by the looks of it, all of the, the hornblowers. And, and it's funny because I got a hornblower mm. vibe from this. So... Isn't that interesting? You know, did Wire you? and the Bloody did as well, which was huge. Um, yeah, he did quite Ken a lot. Ken Grieve. Is, Ken. Are they related? Should we find out. <laughs> Grasping if, at if, straws if not, that. We'll, we'll, write, we'll write to them and uh, <laughs> tell them to, to sort it out. Um, Ken Grieve started his job as yes. a cameraman. He moved on to, to directing. He began his career with Coronation Street. And Grieve... It was brought up in Edinburgh, the son of Henry Grieve, a plant manager at British Aluminium. Or as oh, Shelley would write say, this aluminum. down, someone. Aluminium. Um, and his wife, Les- I'll, I'll go into that voice now. His How wife, Ned Al- Leslie, Al- was a seamstress. Aluminium, aluminium. He had an older brother called Robin, <laughs> and he attended Edinburgh Academy from where he excelled in geography and history <laughs> and won a scholarship. That's why the Americans say Brian- aluminium, because they can't say aluminium. I don't think they are related. He grieved four children with his wife, uh, Fiona, and they remained together until their death in 2010. Uh, Though working with Douglas Adams on Destiny of the Daleks, they struck up a friendship that would last Adams' lifetime. Wow. In in the 1990s, Grieve returned to base himself in Edinburgh and lived in Marchmont. 2009, he was diagnosed with melanoma and had to withdraw from the film production with Hugh Laurie. He mentored young aspiring film. I'm just, re- I'm just enjoying reading this and boring everybody. I, I don't know whether we're enjoying listening to it, though. Well, the last bit here is he mentored aspiring film mentors at Edinburgh's film house, Youth Theatre Group, Scottish Kids Are Making Music, which is abbreviated to SCAM. 
There we go. Sorry, were you still talking? Yes. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to jump on. The objective on. was to bore everybody. <laughs> I'm going to jump succeeded. on. We just had a little moment of acetaminophen being yeah. mentioned yeah. because aluminum. of me not being able to say whatever you guys call Al- aluminum. Aluminium. Aluminium. Um, <laughs> as I was watching this, yes. and it was that all of a sudden we realized what was happening, and that it was it was let's let's create let's have all these murders happen so we can hide a murder, you know, so the murderer is going to hide his murder, the, mm-hmm. the the most important murder. Made me think that that was something I had seen in a true crime show that I had watched, and I thought wrongly that it was the there was a guy who uh, poisoned his wife, wanted to kill his wife, but went ahead and killed a bunch of other people to sh- to to throw the scent off of the fact that his, that was his intent was to kill his wife. And what he did was he laced a bunch of medication um, that was on the shelf at like the drugstore with like cyanide, and so a bunch of people died. And then his wife actually didn't die, but so I, w- I was thinking that this was the there was Tylenol that had this happen. And as I was reading that, I just said it said in parentheses acetaminophen, and I thought, oh, how funny because that's you guys. That just every time I see acetaminophen, I think of you. But that's it turned it. out to be cold medicine, and it wasn't the Tylenol ones. But it was um, this that then led me down a. Uh, uh, I don't know a, a Wikipedia hole of actual there were murders serial killers in America that were c- committing ABC murders oh it happens a lot it, it's, it is yeah. a, a, quite a common thing that so that it was people... just yeah so I, I discovered there were some in, in uh, upstate New York there were some in California there was one in uh, South Africa like so it was just very fascinating that these were people copycatted this whole concept of letters and cities and things like that and in committing murders so mm. Agatha Christie inspiring serial killers as well yeah that is the trouble isn't it yeah, yeah. yeah. the trouple with all these things though, when you glorify things like this isn't yeah. it that you do get the, the levels of it it's like apparently someone's invented a TARDIS after watching Doctor Who <laughs> that's just crazy isn't it oh well, I mean, based on this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it a four because, uh, you know, five is reserved for only the finest. But I would say this is very good. Like, I really enjoyed it. And mm. I think it's a classy production. And I'm giving it a four, four exclamation well. marks. Definitely four exclamation marks. I'm giving it a four as well because Poirot kind of as a set and as a series and as, as a for what it is, I just think is a fantastic achievement to last so long and still be brilliant by the end of it. So, yeah, that's my my personal view. Okay. Uh, well, I'll give it a hearty three because I thought it was really good and I did enjoy it. I did find it a bit hard going uh, the first uh, two thirds, really. It's a winder, isn't it? It gets yeah. faster. And, and it just reminded me of how dull I used to find it back in the day. But I shall probably watch some more now. You know, funnily mm. enough, um, I got to the end of it early this morning and I thought, oh, it's finished playing. And I went um, off to, what did I do? I went and had a shower. When I came back in the room, the next episode had started playing and as I walked through the door, <laughs> I didn't know it was playing. As I walked through the door, there was a huge round of applause from a crowd of people who was really <laughs> weird just coming out of the shower like, whoa, oh, what's going on? <laughs> I don't know what the next episode's about. And then someone said, I'm terribly sorry if I clapped too hard. <laughs> That's one of the lines. Who's that Godfrey from Dad's Army? <laughs> Shelley? Uh... I'm going to go same as Benji. I'm going to give it a four because yeah. I I didn't find it draggy in the beginning at all. I draggy. Just, I just, I, it kept my attention the whole time and I, I was pleased with the bait and switch of my own, oh, I figured it out because I'm so smart. Yeah, that's no. good, yeah. Um, so, and I just, I really, really enjoyed it and... <sighs> Uh, it definitely, as I was watching it, I thought I need to watch more of this because he is David Suchet. I always say his name wrong. Suchet, we just say. Suchet yeah. uh, was so remarkable. I just, I fell in love with that character. I, I thought he was amazing. He so. lived it, didn't he? I mean, yeah. he totally yeah. lived that. And, and, and really having really... seen him in a Blot on the landscape. That just shows what an amazing actor he is, because it is such a different 
Well, he's person. in uh, one of uh, your Peter because you love Peter Capaldi, don't you? He's in one yeah. of those episodes. Oh, as is well. he? Yeah. Oh, okay. What's the, I can't remember what the story is called, but you you wouldn't recognise because he is his performance is totally different. Um, huh. It's the one where there's something about a man who's made of wood or something. Is that right? Oh, I can't remember. It oh, was yes, in the I it was in the final one. series anyway. Hold on. Filmography. I'm yes, going he was really to... creepy. He was creepy in that, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He just played. It just says landlord. The landlord. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't in comes what. Jamie Anderson. Oh, season ten. Knock knock. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, when they. Okay, I know what that is. I know what that one is. Hello. Bonjour. Hello, Jamie. Hello. Jamie Anderson, Swamp thank you for joining us. There. Hello. It's Hi. a real pleasure to be here. It's been about three weeks, I think, hasn't it? Feels like three years. Yes. I since missed, you've arrived. I've missed you all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've missed you all terribly. I was going to say until you said that. <laughs> Sorry, I spoiled it. Yeah. How's life on the farm? Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, we've got a new duck that's arrived from somewhere. I think it's a Muscovy. Muscovy? Must yeah. be. Yeah! yeah. Uh, have you named it anything? Uh, well, I, I'm suggesting Colin, because I thought that was very suitable. Mm, yes, a duck. Mm. <laughs> Five <laughs> points so. to Briggs for his duck impression. Duck. Oh. Quack. Goose. <laughs> oh. Right. Sounds like a duck that swallowed a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> a muskazoo duck. Uh, muskazoo. Uh, yeah, which yeah. sounds like a character, some kind of mist. The great muskadoo. Well, I'm glad we've invented a new kid's character in the first 45 seconds of my arrival. Well, it's 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 a pleasure <laughs> to have you here, Jamie. Um, are you a What's fan? What's feeling? Are you are you a fan of Hercule Poirot? Uh, Suchet or non Suchet? Suchet. 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 Side source of Suchet. <laughs> In so, a sachet. <laughs> sachet of Suchet. I remember watching a lot of Suchet Poirot with uh, mum and dad when I was younger. And um, actually, weirdly, despite it being a quite a grown up pro- program, yeah. feeling quite captivated by John Suchet's. Um, David, David Suchet's. Whichever no, Suchet David, is. David Suchet's the newsreader. <laughs> Thank you. It would be weird if they're it was brothers, the newsreader. They're thing. brothers. Yes, yeah, no, I, that's why I was replacing the first names and forgetting which one was which. But yeah, being captivated by uh, by John Suchet's. Um, David uh, Suchet. No, this is we're getting the wrong way round. No, yeah, dear. See, it's David, David is the actor. David Suchet's Poirot <laughs> and John <laughs> Suchet's the newsreader. Thank you. Oh, I just had you. to look at my notes. I'm like, I've been I just saying got David this whole time. Some old Suchet or other. I'm a big fan of the Suchet brothers in their portrayals as news readers and uh, detectives. <laughs> he is quite. So, he was quite a famous newsreader for a while in this country. Uh, John the Suchet. The one that was. <laughs> they should have swapped round for uh, a couple of episodes. Can you imagine that great. one? Here yeah. is the news today in the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> uh, the little oh, grey cells were missing from Boris Johnson. Uh, <laughs> hey, bit well, of politics, did so. anyone see the John Malkovich one? No. Yeah. They just did it in 2018. Yeah, I haven't I'm seen sure it. I remember a clip and then thinking, ah, uh, he's no Suchet. Oh, what about, of course, uh, Kenneth Branagh did one with a huge moustache, didn't he? Oh, jeez. That was actually quite good, I thought, that murder on Kenneth the Kenneth Branagh's great. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, I mean, surely I've never, has anyone ever read any of the stories, any of the books? No. no. They must describe I've never read a book that- in my life. <laughs> well, he is described as having a fantastic mustache and an egg-shaped head. That's is it. Is how it? Agatha Christie describes him. So they don't say what kind of fantastic mustache. It's just, just that... I, maybe they do. They did, what I read didn't go into because David detail. Suchet's one, but it just it makes me want to yeah, itch it's like my a little... top lip because yeah. it's so full of grease, isn't it? It's yeah. weighed it's down with, up, with wax. It? Yeah. yeah. And you can see the shaved parts. Yeah. The hair should be there, but it's not. Mm, The notable absence of moustache hair. Can I do a plug? Yes. What? For moustaches? Yes, for the new Anderson's new moustache wax. (laughs) No, The handlebar. For my friend Mark Aldridge's book, uh, Agatha Christie's Poirot, The Greatest Detective in the World, which is the ultimate guide to all incarnations and literary uh, iterations oh, of Poirot. Wow, yes. Have you got it's a very, copy of it there? 
No, no, there's a, there's there's an image of it though. Oh, oh, and they, oh I like that. And it, That's and it nice... mirrors the, the the Poirot logo as well, beautifully. Yeah, clever, isn't yeah. it? Anyway, yes, he's. I think he's like the world's foremost expert on all things Agatha Christie. What? Well, right. then don't have him listen to our podcast. I'm no, going to no, send him the link in, immediately after this is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Like, they're wrong, wrong. There, they're wrong, wrong. They're wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, I talked about Agatha Christie uh, cheating, you know, that she always, unlike some thriller writers, all the clues are there for you to work out if you're smart enough. That's not possible with an Agatha Christie myst- mystery. She just, she produces something in the third act that you could never have known about. And the whole, the whole audience go, oh, really? That's very <laughs> clever. Of course it's clever because she never told you in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, I quite like that. It's, yeah. it, it does. It does well. You know, that's the thing. It it it, it does well. It yeah. makes Poirot look good. What more do you want? Quite frankly, mm. friendly. And her grandson, I think grandson, who is something to do with the estate, it lives not far away from me. Really? Hmm. Oh. There you go. Oh, There's an exciting oh. factoid you weren't yes. expecting. At least you know. Well, if you, her. If, she if has an murdered, older. He'll be able to help Agatha you out, Christie find has you. an older brother who was born in Morristown, New Jersey, who, which is 20 minutes away from me. So. Oh, well, uh, well consider me seen uh, and raised. I just <laughs> murdered someone. How's that? No, no, that's not that. No, I went too With far. With a knife but... in the back in the cinema. <laughs> yes, yes, yes and, it, and it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and then falling back over the couch. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was boring them with my anecdotes of being in Agatha Christie plays and oh. dying spectacularly. And Brilliant. fabulous death scenes. Dying was fabulous. Yeah, I expect nothing less. Uh, you need to wash that jumper, Nick Briggs, because uh, you can't wear the Thunderbird's Christmas jumper every day for the rest of your life, you know. I can. Oh, yes. I can and I will. <laughs> I can wear it for at least a week, can't I, without washing it? Well, certainly across the Christmas period. It'll yeah, be fine. Well, and you're wearing a shirt under it, so exactly. it's not in direct contact with your no, body. No, I just, would never. just had a collar sewed in to give the effect of, of undergarments. <laughs> that's, that's called a dicky. <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. The it's Briggs, called a dicky. Yeah, Briggs like a dickie. fake collar is called, or a fake turtleneck is called a dicky. I noticed in the uh, in the episode of Poirot that he didn't have a proper shirt, did he? He had a sort of vest on, and he had a collar with a, a front bit and, oh. and fake collars on his. Uh, not Perhaps Poirot, the murderer, was wearing the, a the dickie fake as well. Did you not notice that in the oh, scene? Oh, cast. Where, yeah, cast, cast. No, I did not notice yeah. that. Go back and watch it's that bit. It's fascinating if you're into uh, shirt wear. Um, hmm. Is there anything else you want to say, Jamie? Uh, when is this episode airing? It is going out on the 3rd of January. Happy New Year, in that yes, case. Yes, there we go. <laughs> I was just covering myself in case this was going out, you know, the, the Tomorrow. second Sunday of April or something. And then I, I mean, Patreon followers will get it, follow, followers, followers will get it the week before, but, you know. Well, which well, won't be New Year, which will be slightly odd, won't yeah, it? Yeah, then Come happy on. just about New Year very soon. Yeah. <laughs> Brace yourself. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Hopefully it'll it'll actually happen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, that's, oh, the, that's bleak, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, Thanks, you're welcome. So glad I came now. <laughs> well, well, that, that, ne- no, next week, we... I just tell Jamie, we're going to be uh, doing commentary for episode four of Inferno. Just, I'm sure you're thrilled by that, aren't you? Gosh, how long's that taken you to get to episode four? Well, we've four? forgotten about 40 it. 40 right? years, 40 years. <laughs> I was going to say, didn't you start in 1970-something? And now you're finally 1970, arrived. yeah. Yeah, we were what? watching it when it was on. <laughs> <laughs> you did the first That's when we started. Commentary. Before podcasts even existed. Yeah. Impressive we, yeah. stuff. We invented well, time, the internet. Time is irrelevant in 2020, let's be real. So Yeah, yeah. that is true. Goodness. To be fair. <laughs> All right, then. Well, uh, I suppose it is time to get close to the microphone. Oh, and well, so uh, don't forget to send your emails to podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. But from me, Nick B, it's B. Me, Benji C, it's could be. And for me, Shelley, it's bye. Can you hear me blinking? Bye. <laughs> Pressing stop now. Ka-chunk. Quack.